Welcome back to Innovators. I'm Julia Sun. Affirmative action began all the way back in 1961. JFK introduced it to address discriminations in education and jobs that had persisted in spite of civil rights law and constitutional guarantees because, well, school admissions officers and HR bosses are humans too. But this AA and its cousin called diversity had become sort of tricky concepts. Where do you draw the line? How much is enough and how much is too much? Joining me to weigh in on this diversity issue in today's tech world is our panel. Welcome ladies, Danielle D'Souza Gill, a Millennial Policy Advisor for America First, Regina Gwynn, co-founder of Black Women Talk Tech, and finally, Loveling Sidhu, co-founder and president of Bank Mobile. Welcome. Thank now you. California, right, just like a lot of places in the United States, has diversity problems. And we're not gonna solve everything <laughs> once for all, so I do wanna go down the panel and ask you guys, if you were to come in and address just one thing, what would it be? Because I hear about gender, I hear about race, I hear about pay gap, I hear about age discrimination. It's an array of things. So what would you focus on? I think right now we hear a lot about corporate culture, a lot about, um, it's not just diversity anymore, it's not just about skin color, or about the numbers, and I think that um, in addition to diversity of skin color, we should focus on diversity of thought in the workplace. And oftentimes this isn't what happens, it's usually a stamping out of diversity of thought, and a lot of people don't feel like they can express different political views in the workplace, especially at tech companies. Um, coming from a tech entrepreneur's perspective, I do think that access to capital is critical. Um, when we think about the fact that 0.02% of women of color receive venture capital, um, which really amounts to maybe $50,000 compared to $1.4 million that a white male counterpart could receive is a, is a gap that's pretty uh, significant. So when we think about the opportunities in order to provide some level of equity there, I think that'd be the thing I'd focus on first. But, you know, women, woman tech entrepreneur as well, I would focus more on gender um, income gap uh, for sure. So just knowing that less than 7% of Fortune 500 companies have women CEOs mm -hmm. is something that sort of makes my blood boil. And to be able to create more opportunities for women to be promoted and to really be paid for the work that they're doing would be a very important improvement. Yeah, because everything you ladies have said so far, it's a systemic problem. It yes. originated from way early in the days. It's not like, oh, this happened today. No. Sure. So in order to prevent this problem to stay around in the next 10, 20 years, what's something that we can do for the younger generations to look ahead and prevent this problem from happening in the future? Yeah, well, I think that training is really important in that I think that the people who are working at these companies should all be, you know, really uh, competent and there should be mutual respect amongst everyone so people can have discussions and be on the same page on things and be able to express themselves at work. Transparency is always key. I think that we have to be able to have adult conversations and, and be okay to just agree to disagree at times, but also respect everyone's perspective um, while being able to also, again, address the, the issues that are very stark and clear. I think that you need to have CEO and leadership buy-in because without their commitment and, and devotion to this topic, you're really not gonna see change. And what we're seeing is that for the larger organizations, they're really struggling to make this change because mm -hmm. it's difficult to make change in legacy organizations. But I think what's exciting and sort of optimistic is that new tech entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs in general, the younger generation, want to start their business with these foundations already in place. And I think that's going to be great for the upcoming generation. Yeah, a lot of companies, large tech companies in particular, they haven't done what you said they should be doing. It's because they didn't really see an incentive to do this. I I would like to see diversity not as a slogan, but people actually think it matters. So which year, or which decade do you ladies predict it'll actually happen that it won't be just a word to sell tickets to events? Well, I think we've already seen actually a lot of diversity in the workplace compared to the past. So there has been a lot of change in that area, but I think that ultimately it will come from once people um, end up having opportunities from the beginning. So it's not just about the end result of, hey, I'm going to give you this job because you're X, Y, and Z, but these people are actually getting skills. They're getting, you know, they're getting where they need to go based on merit. So I think we're getting closer to that. 
I think we're quite a, a, a long ways off. Um, you know, I think that we, when we think about leveling the playing field um, and really understanding what that means, um, personally, professionally, spiritually, emotionally, um, there's a lot of work to be done in order to truly level the playing field and provide equal access to capital, resources, funding, and infrastructure. So um, unfortunately, I can't sit here and say that it's any time soon. Yeah, I, I sort of agree. I think it's an evolution. It's a process that's continuously going to improve. And I'm so grateful that the conversation is starting and we're starting to see some of the positive effects of changes being made. Uh, but I think it's something that we're going to continue to have to work towards. And it's going to be a journey. And hopefully we're going to see a, a positive trends continuing. All right. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your thoughts. And thank you for watching. This is The Innovators.